The future of the Hawk and Rifle, I have a few things to say about that. I think the future of the Hawk and Rifle is great. And I think it falls into three or possibly four major categories. No, you can't have that. I'm going to show you that. I'll hold it up. No, no, I'm going to hear it. You've got to use it. You've got to have a no, side thing like Bobby does. You can see why I've never get anything done. Anyway, there are collectors who collect original Hawken rifles. And they pay from $25,000 up. They never shoot them. They sometimes show them. They keep them in the closet, and they are investments to them. Now, some people really understand them, and some people can be a, a prize horse or a prize bull. They don't care. It's only an investment. Okay? That's a group. I don't have to fall in that group. The next group down is really high-class custom Hawken reproduction makers, and they will make Hawken rifles that look like original rifles. Now, the top of the heap is people like Bob Browner over here, and people of that variety who make Hawken reproduction rifles in the $5,000 range. Now, I personally think they're made too well, and I don't think the Hawken Craftsman made them that well. And Bob is producing rifles, and Jim Chambers and other people that make rifles of that variety are making what I call museum quality rifles. And certainly, if you want to pay $5,000 or more and have one, that's fine. But I'm down if you're going to take that on too much. Okay. The third group that down here, well, it was actually five years now, the third group that's down here is gun builders who produce rifles, but they produce them like the Hawkins shop did. Uh, they don't use inferior products in any way, but they don't spend the immense time with the fancy curls and the fancy carving or engraving or anything like that. And they produce just a standard Hawken rifle, which most of the Hawken rifles were. I'd like to reiterate on the fact that there is no standard Hawken rifles. There were guys who wanted squirrel rifles, guys who wanted off the long guns, rifles of anything and any type. And if you look at a bunch of them from the big collection, go up and take a look at them. We're talking about the guns that the Hawken shop made, which was the classic, and that's how this thing got its name, the classic Hawken Hanstock plane rifle. A rifle that was built in the tail end of the fur trapping period through the buffalo hunter because they needed a big bore half stock cat block that would do the job on the buffalo range. I mean, let's face it, a deer hunter doesn't use that, doesn't need that kind. Maybe, maybe a moose hunter or something would. But there were as many type of Hawken as you can possibly see, different calibers and so forth, because when a man ordered a gun, he ordered it to a specific thing, of the use or the need that he was going to put to it. And it had to be that piece that Samuel Hawkins or Jake Hawkins made for him if he was going to pay them any money to make that gun. He didn't pay them a lot of money to make the gun they wanted and thought that he needed. They made the gun that he wanted and needed, or else they wouldn't have been in business too long. Thank you, Eric. I agree with that. As we come down, the rifles are made today after the old tilt, like I call the Museum Quality Hawkins. There's gun makers out there that make a very nice Hawkins rifle, but they don't go to all the effort to do all the inlays and so forth. And those sell around $3,500, okay? Let's come down another notch. We have, which I think is one of the most underused and under sought after type rifles at the moment. Most people that get into the Hawken business and want to build a Hawken rifle from a kit will buy a kit that's offered by several people today. 
and it'll be four to six hundred dollars or whatever, and they'll make up a rifle, a Hawken. It looks like a Hawken. It's generally shaped a little bit like a Hawken. And, you know, it's very satisfactory. It's going to kill a deer just as well as an original rifle. But it's in the four to six hundred dollar range, and I think that's where most people is the entry level of Hawken shooters today. Okay? And I want to talk just a little bit about that. We've had a depletion of that in the last few years. Back in the 1970s, when Art was king down at Friendship, the following companies made Hawken rifles. CVA, Thompson Center, Green River Rifle Works, Sharon, Browning, Navy Arms, Euro Arms, Cherry Corners, Ithaca, Ozark Mountain, Western Arms, and at the Hawkins Shop. What, what an entree. No, no, the thing about this is when we got into the business, everybody was fighting for cheap. I mean, they've got a gun for $150 here, and ours is only $75, and it'll do the same damn thing. It's like a guy talking about a Rolls Royce here and a Volkswagen over there. They both do the same damn thing. They'll take it to the store so you can buy groceries. There's a lot of difference in that. We couldn't compete with cheap. They had to have a million dollars a year to sell a million guns. We were that big and didn't never planned to be. So we fought for best. Now, if somebody wants quality and they want the, the, the things that are involved in this thing that are as close as what we spend all the time to get together on, and they want a fine gun, the problem is you've got to have two things. You've got to have the desire and the money. And that eliminated us making a thousand guns. I don't know how many we made. I ran the shop and I handled the business and I kissed the girls and all that. But a fellow up on the hill here by the name of Greg Grimes worked for me, and Greg's anal, he remembers everything. He knows more about hawking rifles in my business than I do. I fell into this by accident. I just happened to have the money, and God let me buy the guns. And, and, and things like that worked out real well for me. But Bob's reiterating on the things like this that are pluses and minuses that go along with this, and, and I think that the, the bottom line of what he's coming to is quality, you will tell and authenticity and the guys who wrote down the aisles in friendship who have one of our guns or one of the guns that was built from our kits or even somebody else's kit that was done in quality is recognizable some of the guns were made by other guys thompson center's run five six seven hundred dollars now for a good used gun that somebody's built and that's unusual as hell our Hawken rifles were built by the shop, or by the gunsmiths that built them under our observation, were running five, six, seven thousand dollars a year. And that's finished guns that have the reputation attached to them. That's why you, guy, you get a gun that was made by Joe Schmottstuck, and it's an absolute gorgeous mother. You've never seen anything as fine as it would be in the world. But you take that stand, it's not worth a hell of a lot of money because nobody knows who the hell he is. You take the same damn gun and put Bob Briner's name to it, and it's worth a fortune. So there's a lot of involved with who did it, how they did it, when they did it, and from what they did it. Agree with that? I do. Good. Good. I do too. Okay. I kind of gave you a list of people, uh, companies that made Hawkins, including uh, the Hawkins shop. But I'm going to tell you today some companies that make Hawkins, the kits. And again, I feel as though the entry-level kit in the four to $600 range is where most people start. Petroselli makes a good one. Investment Arms makes a good one. Tradition and Lyman. Also, there's Beckettone again, Track of the Wolf, if you just want to go for parks. Now, I want to plug somebody here. I want to plug a guy by the name of uh, Ethan Yazel. Ethan has a website which is called I Love Muzzle Loading. And on that website, he goes through building these 
intermediate kit rifles. He tests them and evaluates them. And I highly recommend that you look at that website because I think there's a lot of potential in that price range. Now, <clears throat> the last thing you can do is you can go down to Friendship and buy some parts and try to put them together. And generally, you're not going to end up by building a Hawking rifle. You're going to build a Plains rifle that's going to have a barrel and you know, so forth and so on. They shoot. They all shoot the same. Yeah. Okay. I spoke with Carol Ripplinger, the head of Track of the Wolf, the other day, and she says, right now, our business in kits and or parts of rifles, especially Hawkins, is more than we can handle. We can't handle the business. It's the best we've ever seen in 30 years. And I says, why? And she says, well, the COVID, a lot of people stayed at home. They wanted something to do. And actually, as older gentlemen like me and Art, uh, building rifles for their children and grandchildren, believe it or not. But they say that she's got more things. And also, the Track of the Wolf doesn't even offer Hawking kits anymore because Hawking kit consists of maybe 25, 30, 30 parts. They can order them, a guy orders one, and they're missing a thimble or something, so they can't complete the order. And so they quit doing it, and then they dropped it from their catalog. That doesn't mean their lack of interest. It just means that you've got to order them piece by piece from them. They're not going to sell you a kid anymore. But the business is great. The business is good down in friendship. And, uh, yeah, that, and I feel as though that the future of Hawking Rifles, the future of people that understand and love Hawking Rifles, as Art and I do, is good and will be good in the future. But it's going to depend upon you guys. I don't see a lot of young guys here except our two boys over here. Uh, all of us old graders are here. And uh, they're off playing soccer ball or something. And they're just not hunting and fishing like we used to do when I was kids. So yeah, that's a negative factor. Bob's got a lot to say about what he does in the building and so forth like that. And, and, and what I'm going to do is, is, is interject something entirely different and then let him finish it off so I can go ahead and spend a little time with the boys. And uh, what I've brought along and what I wanted to do uh, when I started this business, uh, I just bought a rifle. And we dealt an antique gun. We had, a, we had antique arms appraisers. Our antique arms is what it was. It's a shop in St. Louis before it ever became the Hawkins shop. And we dealt in Civil War things, men's collectibles of the period and the time from the, the Buckskinners all the way up to the Civil War. And when I bought my first Hawkins rifle, I paid $1,000 for it and we had beans for a week and it was hard on me. But it was a brand spanking new condition Hawkins rifle from a dealer, an antique. And I didn't think much of that, except I loved it. It was neat, it was pretty, and then as time goes on, I bought another one, and another one, and another one, and I bought them and sold them. I sold six guns before I started collecting them. But I kept the first one because it was my first love, and it was a beautiful gun, and that was fine for that. Then somebody said, you know, we're, as I mentioned before, though they were going for cheap and we went for expensive, but the only way you could do that was to know what the hell you were doing. So we took that original gun that I have, and I've got a picture of me that's sort of a ridiculous thing, and I'm holding this gun with my skins on and so forth, and it's that gun. It's the only picture I've got of the damn thing. Because we built our hook and rifle copying that gun, nut for nut, bolt for bolt, and everything else. Keith Newbar did that, and if anybody ever talked to you that's an old buckskinner, or somebody who builds guns, Keith Newbar, was actually Bob Bruner's better half during that time. He was a master at what he did, gorgeous. He worked with KRA, did a lot of KRA guns, all front lines and fine guns like that. 
and they could bring him a bunch of splinters and a piece of and, and a crowbar, and he could put the, that thing together where it looked like the original piece, and you couldn't tell that the damn thing had been done to it. And I told him one time, I said, Keith, how the hell can you do this when you do work that nobody can see? And I said, that's got to be so disappointing. I said, because then they could see it, it was a bad job. And he said, well, that's the way I do my work, Art. And he built Hawking Rifles for us. And that's why the, the prototype that you all have seen, if you looked at it, that's down there, is an absolutely exact copy of that first gun that I had. And that's old thunder, that, that's my gun. And it's been ridden hard and put away wet and shot at many of the shoot. And I know that at the Hawking match in St. Louis, I've got a, the most beautiful group of shots you ever saw back there in the woods someplace, but it never was on a target. But, so I, I had a fine gun, but I just couldn't shoot the damn thing. And before Bob gets around here to do a lot of his stuff, I want to spend a little time with the boys. I want to yeah, get yeah, no art. I want to. But I don't have much more to say. You go ahead with what you got. Well, well let me finish this. Okay, you do that. And the reason I want to do this is because I usually tear up at the end of this thing and I want to be able to wipe my eye and walk away without sitting in front of me. Here, I'll I got this. Okay. I, this happened sometime along in my life. This happened after the, after the fact, so to speak. I had already sold my collection of Hawkins and Givers and Derricks and Byers and uh, T.J. Albright's and all that kind of stuff, I sold my collection back to the Hawking family. And so they are where they really need to be. And uh, I still had my rifle. I'm sitting down one day and I'm talking, and, and, and I do a lot of, I, uh, I was an English major at school and I do a lot of typing and, and so forth. And uh, I thought, and I love poetry. And I sat down one day and I thought, shoot, somebody ought to put this down on a pen and ink and see what the hell they can do about this gun. Now, most of us sort of look silly at people who fall in love with an inanimate object. Now, some of you ladies might, might fall in love with that little black dress or maybe with mother's brooch or something like that. And the men can usually associate with their car a sports car or a truck or, or a boat or something like that. Well, I was that way with my Hawking rifles. And so when I sat down to write this poem, I think Jake and Sam knew what was happening because when I went and put pencil to paper, the words just basically flowed off of there and came up with this story, which I look back on now, and it sort of sounds like my life. Now, it's in a certain thing because people go through different stages and there are, are rungs on the ladder that you go through as you progress yourself in life. So I wrote this and it's called Old Thunder and Me. It's, it's the saga of a Hawking rifle. Now, I've memorized this poem and I know it verbatim, but the minute I'm sitting in front of a crowd, if I read this thing, if I don't read this thing and try to say it, it's by Oscar moment, and I don't want to screw it up, so I'm going to read it to you. When once I got my mind on straight and figured where it's at, I kicked the traces of the east with just my coat and hat. I heeded Horace Greeley's words, because truly they seemed best, and set my feet ahead. I set my feet ahead for the gateway to the west. Now when I hit St. Louis town, I didn't spare a cent to outfit with the very best, because I was sure hell bent to be the best darn mountain man that ever bore that name. So to the hawk and gun shop eventually I came. Their rifle's reputation was a legend all its own, a gun so true and sturdy, sure the finest ever known. So rugged and so beautiful, the best that they could make was that big boar half stock cap lock made for me by Sam and Jake. Took me barely about a week, working every way to learn that rifle in and out, because sure enough, someday, I'd call upon her talent in some moment of true strife, and there'd have to be that knowledge if you were to save my life. Her happy voice in times of fun would crack a cheerful sound, but her words of fear or anger would shake the very ground. A half an inch and then some was a measure of her bore. Just to face that awesome cavern would have chilled you to the core. Now I perceived a friend so true to should surely have a name. 
a title that would tell the world that she was far from tame. Old Thunder, sure, that fit her fine. She'd answer to that call. Old Thunder would do very well, and lightning was the bow. The years were hard, but good to us. I guess we'd shared God's grace. Because many times I nearly saw the old Grim Reaper's face, and more than once we cheated, cheated death, or evened up to score by some help from the Almighty, our old Thunder's mighty roar. And now my time for hunting's past, my eyes are growing weak. My voice, once loud and laughing, is just a whisper when I speak. The world no longer knows us, old Thunder and her friend, and I fear the times we once knew have come sadly to an end. I, I don't regret the things I've done, and Lord knows that's a heap. And I sure ain't want to ask for much. I've always earned my keep. So please, dear God, do grant me when I hear the angels' song and face the happy hunting crowd. Let old thunder come along. Thank you. You're headed back to the carpenter shop. Okay. Thank you, Art, uh, for your heartfelt uh, comments. And uh, if it wasn't for Art Russell, the gentleman standing over there, we would be a lot of years behind on our hawking knowledge and understanding. And uh, those are his two boys there, and uh, they're headed back for the shop. Uh, one of them used to work in the Hawkins shop, so uh, they have a little history there. Well, I'm not going to bore you anymore, but personally, I think the future for the Hawkins rifle is good. I think it falls into seven class uh, categories or classifications. I think you need to decide where you want to be. In other words, do you want to make a kit gun or do you want to fork up some money and buy an original? If you buy an original, I don't think it's as good as an investment as a reproduction. Why I don't think so is you would never shoot it. You would put it in a bank vault. You would look at it like a investment. If you had a reproduction rifle made reasonable and made it like a good copy, you could shoot it and enjoy it the rest of your life, give it to your children. And Herb's telling you right now that if you buy, and he, he's involved with money all the time. If you buy, and let's just say you buy and invest in a, uh, a high quality four or $5,000 rifle, now it's going to be worth twice that in several years. Because there's just not that many people around making them. Plus you can enjoy it. You don't have to worry about losing it or breaking it if it's an original. So I think it's a good investment, but you need to find out where you enter, enter into this market. Okay, I'm done. I don't have anything else to say. I've got a sore throat, unfortunately. <clears throat> Excuse me. But if you have a couple of questions, I'd be glad to answer it if I can. And so give it to me if you have something you want to know. We, I didn't realize, I thought this was just a bull session we were sitting here at the beginning and Bob says, oh no, we're on, we're on, uh, Greg, do you want to say a couple comments here? I don't know what you talk about. Well, we talked about you, we mainly talk about people that are on. We, we'd like to have the owner of the current Hawking Shop just give you a couple of comments, they're ready to go. And I'm ready to go, but why don't you say a couple things? Well, I'm nowhere near as entertaining as Art Russell in this guy, so bear with it for a few minutes. Um, a little bit about it, I know we're supposed to be talking about the future of Hawking. As long as I'm responsible for the legacy of Samuel Hawking through the original Hawking shop, we're going to keep pushing, we're going to keep going. I. I think something like this is invaluable as far as educating people as to what Hawken really is, really was. Hopefully it's going to continue in the future. Uh, but boy, we need some kids in here. We, you know, anybody under 50, 
will will work and uh, to keep this thing going. But uh, my my intention, and I, I'm really honored to be entrusted with the legacy of the original Hawk and Shop. We're not going to try to make it bigger. We'll always try to make it better. We'll keep our production very low and very personal, and and strive to keep Samuel. And I say Samuel Jacob is, is obviously part of the equation. We don't know as much about Jake. We know a lot about Sam. We're pursuing the Hawk and Shop through a, a classic Plains Hawk and an S Hawk and rifle. So we're, we're, we're going to keep it up until I'm physically not able to anymore. Some good American person comes by that's interested in the history and wants to take it off our hands. So um, God willing, we'll be here next year and the Hawk and Chop will keep going. So, yes? How, how does your supply line compare with, he was talking about Track the Wolf before, the fact that they can't get the parts so they can put together a, a kit. We make all of our own parts. We are responsible. All, all the castings we use are under our control. We make our own springs. Um, we, we have our barrels made by Rice Barrel Company, which is an extremely reputable and high quality barrel company. And I, I buy my wood out of West Virginia. I have uh, my, my, my stock man is in Pennsylvania that cuts them. I don't have any problems along that line except my own stupidity of running out of stuff and forgetting to keep up with it. But locks, breaches, tames, trigger groups are all in house. Like I said, we even, we even bend our own springs. So we're, we're in good shape supply wise. Uh, biggest problem I have is finding American made wood screws of the right size. Uh, any of the machine screws we have turned. You know, they're, they're doable, but the wood screws are hard right now, so I, I try to keep a good supply of that. But we're in good shape there, so thanks. Yeah. Anybody else? Well, thank you all for showing up, and um, let's look forward to it next year. And, uh, it'll be bigger and better, and uh, hopefully, although Bob did a fantastic job of coordinating this thing, um, he'll have some experience, and he'll have the porta potties down on the server. <laughs> we'll give him a raise next year. Pardon? We'll give him a raise next year. Yes, yeah, let's double his salary. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks.